Good evening, everyone. This is uh, Welsh Athletics Stay Involved webinar series number 29. Um, most of you won't know who I am. My name is Jim Alexander. I'm the national pole vault coach for Ireland. And uh, Zoe Brown has invited me to come this evening and share with you some of my experiences uh, over 30 years of coaching pole vault, but especially uh, about how to uh, get started at your club. Uh, if an athlete comes up to you and says, uh, I'd like to try pole vault. Now, normally when I do this session, we'd be at a track. I would have uh, an athlete with me as an assistant. Um, it would all be much simpler, but obviously, given the current situation we all find ourselves in, that's not possible. So it'll be a little trickier going through this evening, but hopefully we'll be able to, uh, as I say, share with you the information. Um, perhaps most importantly of all, uh, this information and particularly the related videos uh, that go with it are going to be held on the Welsh Athletics YouTube channel um, so that you can download this uh, resource and, and, and use it as a practical tool uh, at your club. Uh, also, Zoe has added me to the Welsh Athletics Pole Vault team, Microsoft Teams account. So if anybody has any practical difficulties in, in doing some of this at the club, I'm more than happy to uh, stay involved and, and, and help give you some further uh, feedback or, or, or information. So without further ado, I think we have some housekeeping stuff to go through first, so maybe if we could move to the next slide. So I think everybody, as I understand it, is already on mute. Uh, to help improve the sound quality. So unfortunately, you're, you're stuck with just my voice. Um, for those of a technical ilk, the hand up function apparently is disabled. Sorry, don't know what that is. Um, if you have a technical issue, I'm told you should put it in the chat box and a, a technician will come help you. And if you have any questions relating to the presentation, uh, put those in the, the question box as well. So. The plan is that we're going to pick up the questions in a, in a Q&A session uh, towards the end. Um, and, and as I say, hopefully I'm looking forward to a, a good positive exchange when we get to that point. So I think that's all the housekeeping uh, that we need to do. So if we push on now for the, the next slide. So what I thought I might do uh, before we get into the, the, the technicalities of pole vault was just, just share a little bit of my personal history. Um, or called my coach journey. Um, obviously, I don't know your particular background out there as to what's motivating you to want to become involved with coaching pole vault. So I just thought I'd share with you what my motivation was and you know, see if it rings any bells with yourself. So um, basically, I came from the background of being a poor pole vaulter uh, in the period 1981 to 1986. Um, I had a personal best of four meters 30. And uh, I've had at least one of my female athletes has bettered that, uh, much to her delight. Um, basically, back in the 80s, the amount of knowledge about pole vault in the UK was very limited. Um, being in Northern Ireland, it was then especially limited. So as a result of all of that, I ended up retiring in frustration uh, in 1986. But I still had the interest in the event, and I, I was still curious to try to find out what it was that I wasn't doing that would have made me a better vaulter. So I started doing a bit of coaching in 1987. Uh, that in turn led to me getting my UKA level three and level four coaching qualifications in 1988 and 1990. So in 1987, I started coaching two brothers. Um, <laughs> the irony was that I got a phone call from their father saying that they were using the wooden pole to hold up the clothesline to jump over a hedge between the front garden and the back garden. So he reckoned they had an interest in pole vaulting. And uh, so I went on, uh, they went on rather to jump four meters 41 and four meters 60 respectively in 1990. But the key thing really about these first two athletes that I coached was that I made a tremendous number of mistakes, some real schoolboy howlers when I look back on it now. But really the thing I wanted to emphasize on this slide was it is okay to try things and make mistakes. Like any aspect of life, 
the only way you find out is by trying. Um, so that's a theme that will run through the whole presentation this evening. Um, the key bit is you find with the next athletes that you coach, that you always remember the things you got wrong with the last athletes, and they're the first things you put right with the new athletes, so you end up not repeating them. The good news is, and I'm still good friends with those two brothers some 30 years on. So if we flip to the, the next slide, please. Um, just continuing uh, on from, as I say, from in the 1990s, so then the, the next guy that I coached that benefited from the mistakes that I made with the first two guys, uh, he ended up jumping five meters 20 in 1997 and came seventh in the 1998 Commonwealth Games. Unfortunately, he retired at 22 because uh, university tuition fees were coming in back then, but there was no lottery funding, so we felt he had an obligation to go and get a job and pay off the university fees. So another mistake, as I said here, find a way to hang on to the good ones. So that was something that, that years later, uh, when I had another vaulter in a similar position, I found a way to get funding uh, to keep that athlete in the sport for another couple of years. Um, so I don't have many regrets on my coaching journey, but this one's definitely one because this, this guy was genuinely good and, and left the sport way too early. So on the back of that disappointment, uh, we'd reached 1999 and women's pole vault was coming in more and more. So I, I thought I would try my hand at that. Um, so I was very lucky by 2002, uh, I, I coached an 18 year old to seventh place at the Manchester Commonwealth Games. Um, I'm not going to name any names, but she's actually running the presentation this evening in the background. Um, in 2003, I also coached the first ever Irish vaulter to compete in the European under 20. So, women's pole vault was a particularly uh, enjoyable time for me. Um, and, and I'm still actively involved. And, one of my current athletes, we're going to be following her progression uh, as we go through the presentation. So let's, let's keep going then for the, the next slide. And as I said, I've been very lucky in my, in my coaching career. I've, I've coached some Northern Ireland athletes to various Commonwealth Games, GB athletes to European under 23s and world students, and some Irish athletes then to world under 18, European under 20, and European indoor and outdoor. And really the upshot of all of this is the, the last bullet point. This is really my takeaway, which is coaching pole vault at whatever level you get involved doing it is fantastic fun. And if you're thinking about wanting to get involved, then my advice, pardon the pun, is absolutely jump right in. It's it's tremendous. You'll you'll derive a huge amount of pleasure from it, as I have. Um, and you 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 just don't know where it may take you uh, as you go along. So as I say, that's a little bit about my background. Um, so we're going to jump in now to the, the meat of the presentation. I wanted I put this slide in right at the, at the front because I just wanted to pick up a couple of themes out of it. Um, all field events and pole vault in particular uh, take a long time. So uh, in reality, I've found over the years it takes between eight to ten years from first picking up a pole. Uh, to the point where you're achieving peak performance. Um, uh, some of you may have heard of the, the principle of the, the 10,000 hour coaching model. Um, by that I mean, for example, uh, if you were coaching at your club, uh, an athlete, say, for two hours in a session three times a week, um, and that would equate then to six hours a week and over 40 weeks, that would be 240 hours and over 10 years, that would be around about two and a half thousand hours. Um, similarly, as, as the athlete gets more advanced, if you're then up to three hours in a session and you're working five times a week, that comes out at seven and a half thousand hours over 10 years. Now, it's not expected that you're going to be there for the first session and 10 years later you're going to be there uh, for the final session. Um, as I said, in the second bullet point, you may be one part of the athlete's journey, or you may be lucky enough to travel it all the way. Um, either way, you can make a big contribution to that athlete's development. And in particular, 
when you are starting someone on pole vault for the very first time, there are two or three key must-haves, which if you can ingrain in your athlete over the first six months of their career, uh, get those basics right, you will be doing them a lifetime of good service. Um, so as I say, you can be uh, one part of the journey, but you can also be the most important part of the journey right at the start, or you may be fortunate enough to travel it all the way. One of the things which I'm going to do right at the end of the presentation, um, which is applicable to all, in fact, it's applicable to all track and field events, but particularly field events, uh, is the ratio of technical training versus physical training. Um, that ratio moves as athletes mature and become more experienced. Um, one of the things that we did for a long time badly in Ireland was we had a relentless focus on technical preparation and fixing just the smallest little tweaks and adjustments and ignored the physical development. And pole vault in particular is a very physical event. You need to be strong and fast and flexible to do it. Um, so it, it's something that um, if you're going to get involved in coaching pole vault, it's important to think about right from the get-go. So that's why I've included uh, a slide right at the end on, on how I think you should approach that. So that's kind of the, the some context out of the way. So let's jump in and just clarify what we're going to do today. <clears throat> and as I say, normally I'd be doing this at a track um, with um, beginner athletes and beginner coaches. But we'll, we'll try and do this online as best we can. But what we want to do is, is instill in you the confidence to go out and have a go uh, at your club uh, at Coaching Pole Vault. Okay, so how are we going to do that? Let's go to the next slide and see if we can pick up some clues. So what I tried to do here was to address the age-old question, which is no way can I coach Pole Vault because I haven't got the facilities uh, and I haven't got the knowledge. So you're indeed right. If you want to compete in pole vault, you need to have a set of pole vault landing mats, a runway, uprights, and frequently multiple poles. However, tonight we're looking at uh, right back at the beginning of the process, um, which in UK terms is 365 blue to black. And for that, really all you need is a pole and a sandpit. Um, your club more than likely already has the sandpit and if you haven't got a pole, I'm sure if we talk to Welsh Athletics, we should be able to get you a pole to get you going. So I mentioned a couple of slides back about one of the girls uh, that I'm currently coaching. Um, so her name is Ellie and uh, I wanted to have included a picture of her doing her sandpit drill. Um, so I've been coaching her now for, this is our, our sixth year. Um, and even though she's moved to a point of being a more advanced athlete, she always goes back and, and does some of her sandpit drills because she feels that it, it really helps her uh, as a reminder for her basic shapes. So you can see in the picture on the slide, uh, that it's essentially, it's, it's like a long jump takeoff shape um, with a fully stretched right arm uh, for a right-handed vaulter. Um, and the purpose of doing this drill uh, is to just, as I say, reactivate that shape so that she can use it later on in, in more advanced vaulting. So at the bottom, as you can see, it says the skills learned in the sand pit can then be transferred to the more traditional pole vault setup once a basic competency has been reached. Um, and as I say, so Ellie's very happy that that basic competency in her sandpit drill, uh, she wants to keep going back to it because she feels it's important. So as I mentioned at the start, if you can ingrain that uh, basic shape and basic technique of a sandpit drill into your aspiring athlete in the first six months, you will be doing them a life service of, of, of good uh, input. So, um, again, one of the things that often puts people off pole vault is the view that it is a 
It's way too complex, it's way too difficult. I couldn't possibly do that. So to try and show you that's not the case, uh, we, we distill it down into four uh, essential tasks. So like a long jump or a triple jump or a high jump, there's an approach run. The only difference in pole vault is you, you've got to bring your pole with you. So you've got to carry that whilst uh, accelerating through your approach run. You then have a phase of moving that pole from horizontal to vertical, which we call the plant. Uh, and and that, the output from that then is a takeoff. And then there's a, a, a gymnastic swing to inversion or just a, a swing up, like as if you were swinging on a rope. And then the end of it, if you've done all those um, phases well, then your turn and bar clearance becomes almost automatic and pretty easy to execute. So as I was saying, each phase has a knock-on to the next, and therefore excellence in the one before feeds into excellence in the next one. So as I say, don't don't think of pole vault as the the, the, the total thing that you see. Think of it as four activities that are simpler to master, which if I master each one and then join them together, I get the complex event outcome. So um, again, this is within the context of um, the whole group that would normally be working with me at the track. Uh, we'd, be, we'd be demonstrating how to find your grip and hold the pole correctly, uh, how to uh, carry it, so simulating the run-up by carrying it, and then simulating the plant by lowering the pole through walking drills. And uh, later on, we'll, we'll show some videos of what those walking drills look like. Um, we'll show how to introduce sandpit uh, drills or sandpit vaulting to help develop the plant, which is to say is a pole vault word for take off with a pole. Uh, the takeoff and swing phases, and you can even uh, do some simulation of bar clearance into sandpit. Uh, bear in mind that up until the early 1960s, all pole vaulting was done into sand, and the world record jumping into sand is 478, if I remember rightly. So then we'll show you how to transition from sandpit to mat vaulting. And again, we've got a couple of videos for that, um, and then finally. Uh, I just want to take a couple of slides to show what happens next. So once you've got your athlete with that uh, basic competency in pole vault, how do you then take them on to the next level? All right, so without getting too hung up on the last bit, just to give you a few uh, basic fundamentals. Now, um, so we're going to start by a basic thing of holding the pole. Um, on <laughs> For reasons best known to myself, I selected a left-handed vaulter when I was putting this presentation together. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about the dominant hand rather than the, the right hand. So you can see in the top picture that the athlete is holding the pole. I, I normally get vaulters to start with uh, a double overhand grip like so, just about shoulder width apart. Uh, and then you can see uh, with, with the hands hanging down, it's as if you're holding the pole and you're about to execute a clean and jerk movement. Only for the right-handed vaulter, uh, you then take this finger and thumb and turn it through 90 degrees, which you can see in the in the vault in the vaulter picture on the top there. Uh, and she's a left-handed vaulter. She's done that action for her left hand, um, and then the final step would be for the vaulter to rotate 90 degrees so that they're lined up along the pole. Um, as I say, this is this is probably the most difficult slide in the entire presentation because it's so much easier if you just got someone with you to, to demonstrate it. Um, but I think the, the, the key, the, the three keys are shown on the side that uh, what we call the dominant hand is the top hand for right-handed people uh, your dominant hand is the right hand, and for left-handed people, it's your left. That grip that approximately shoulder width apart, uh, and then the knuckles, as I say, facing away from the body. So that's our basic carry position. 
The next question people often ask is, how high up the pole is it safe to hold? Because uh, people naturally have a, a fear of maybe falling backwards um, if, if they've, they've done it wrong. So for absolute beginners, you can see in the picture, you take the dominant hand and you reach up far up the pole as you can, even going as far as standing on tiptoes uh, to, to find the point of maximum stretch uh, that you can, you can go with. I'll be honest, I normally go with maximum stretch plus two fists, but uh, you'll be ultra safe uh, if you're going with just maximum stretch on tiptoes uh, for the dominant hand to find that dominant hand position. Uh, and then that in turn allows you to then come back to this. Once you've found that top hand position, you can then come back to the, the setup position like so. All right. Um, the next one, or the next bullet point down on the previous slide uh, talks about uh, finding the bend point. Um, I wouldn't worry too much about that at this point. Um, again, if you're getting to a point of sort of someone bending a pole when you're doing your sand pit drills, then you can call in help uh, at, at that point. Um, so for tonight, we're just going to focus on that first measuring the grip height of the grip uh, segment. So if we go to the next slide, so having now learned how to pick up the pole and having worked out where to hold the pole, the next thing the novice falter needs to do is to, is to learn how to uh, move along while carrying the pole. It's a pretty unnatural thing to do. Um, so what we, what we stress um, at this point is you, you can see for this right-handed vaulter, the right fist is pretty much set onto the right hip. Um, what we don't want to do when we're moving along our runway is shaking our hands backwards and forwards like this. So we want to put that dominant hand on the hip. So for the right-handed vaulter, right fist on right hip, and we want to try and keep it there uh, with as little movement as possible. It's, it's very difficult to say zero movement, uh, but as little movement as possible. So this is all a little bit abstract at this point. So I think we're gonna uh, cut to a couple of video clips now that'll help us understand um, what uh, running or what, what moving with the pole uh, in a learning situation uh, will look like. So this is uh, from a couple of athletes, a couple of beginner athletes that, that I've been working with. Um, and we're just getting to the point now where, um, so you can see they're carrying the pole. This, in this drill here, we just keep the pole up nice and tall and they're getting used to the idea of throwing your hands up in front of you. That's a very alien thing to do. Uh, and one of the things you will find in pole vault is that the athlete's brain is a fantastic defense mechanism. Uh, unless the brain is absolutely comfortable with what you're asking it to do, it will refuse to let you do it. So this is a drill that I find helps uh, beginner athletes just get used to the concept of have, having the pole out in front because um, that's that's an essential uh, aspect of any pole vault. A lot of people think that if I'm tight into the pole, in other words, if my arms are like this, then I'm going to be safe. The exact opposite is true. Uh, the further extended your arms are, the safer you will be. So that's the first basic walking drill that I do. Uh, we have another walking drill there, um, which we'll, we'll come up in a second. And this drill is when we've now moved to the athlete uh, holding the pole by his or her side. Um, and it's essentially doing the same drill uh, as we saw just now, uh, only with the, the added uh, aspect of introducing the plant action while you're walking. So, um, yep, yeah, so that's the right video clip. There we go. So you can see, so let's just pause, let's just pause it there. For, oh, oh. Okay, great. So you saw in the clip we talked about uh, the right fist being on the right hip. 
there it is there. Um, and so both athletes are learning to move the pole by uh, pushing the right arm up straight whilst keeping it close in to the right hand side of their body. So we don't we don't want it to swing away out like this uh, because that uh, means it's almost impossible to get that right arm straight at takeoff, which is the key movement. So again, you can see at a nice slow walking pace, both athletes are moving the pole in time with the movement of their feet. So we should have pointed out earlier on, you can see it there for the right-handed vaulter, the takeoff foot is the left foot is on the ground uh, and the right knee will then come through uh, to, be, to take up the long jump takeoff position. So in this clip, the, the girl on the right, her hand position is excellent, could not be any better. Um, so I just would like to have seen her right knee come through into a 90 degree position. But like I say, these are these are two beginner vaulters who are just getting to grips with this. Um, but the basics of what they're doing are very good. Okay, so we see it again there from the start. So on the hip, moving forward, on the hip and planting nice and high. So all of these walking drills can prepare the athlete for when they eventually move to the sand pit. Um, and so it doesn't come as a big surprise. Um, as I said, you you spend a lot of time in pole vault preparing the brain to be comfortable with what you're gonna ask the athlete to do. Remember, they've never done this before. So the brain's going, what the heck is this? I don't understand what this movement is. So I find over the years, those walking drills just keep, just help settle uh, the athlete's nerves. <clears throat> I mean that when we come to do the sandpit stuff, the brain's much more relaxed and much more inclined to let you uh, do the work that you want to do. So if we, if we flip on to the next slide, so having uh, now done a little bit of work with walking with the pole, we're now gonna get the athlete to take off uh, and, and move through the air. So again, we have our, le our left-handed vaulter uh, in the pictures and in the right-hand side, I've, I've described that for the, for the right-handed athlete, uh, you want to take off uh, on the left foot. Um, so like we saw in the walking drill, we want to have the right hand fully extended up uh, and the left foot directly underneath you. So that top hand will be at the grip position that we saw a couple of slides back. So we, we've reached up onto tiptoes and we've stretched that dominant hand as far up as we can go. Um, so that's the grip that the athlete is using in these pictures. And then normally off about uh, you, you can do an initial one step drill, which this one is. Um, so the athlete, the left handed athlete, is starting with her left foot on the ground and her left hand high. And then the one step is that, that right knee that's currently at 90 degrees will drive down in front of her. You can see in the bottom pic picture, uh, it becomes the takeoff uh, drive leg and the left knee is up. You can see her left hand or her dominant hand is fully extended. Um, what we're looking for in this one step drill is just to get the confidence to swing in the air. So the sand doesn't put up much resistance to the pull, um, so it makes it nice and easy for the vaulter. Uh, there's not much force comes back through it and they can get used to taking off and moving through the air and the brain's going, oh, okay, right, I'm still alive here. I'm, things are good, so I'm happy to let you do that again. So <clears throat> typically, um, after uh, probably about four or five of these, uh, we would then uh, try to add a little bit of a run-up. Normally, four steps is a, is a good run-up. Um, but this, this would be the first uh, takeoff drill that you would do with your aspiring pole vaulter. So a one step sand pit drive drill. So if we go to the next slide then. Um, yeah, so as I was saying before then, uh, 
this is all very new for the athlete. So what, what is it they should do once they've taken off? So as it says on the right hand side, you're looking at, again, like any jump, long jump, triple jump, high jump, chest is up, jumping up uh, into the takeoff position. The difference in pole vault is you've obviously got this arm to act as a, as a pendulum for you to swing around. Uh, and that's the bit that's new for the brain. Um, so as it says there, a triple extension of the takeoff leg. So that's just harsh words for a full extension. You're wanting the leg to be straight like that. You don't want it to bend. So nice and straight. And then you're going to land on that leg in the sand. And as it says at the bottom there, very important, aim to land deep in the sand. So this slide, as it very helpfully states, is adding a run up. So, uh, as we said, probably four steps uh, is the best at the beginning because you don't want to overload uh, the, the, the athlete's brain with too much speed early on. <clears throat> so, at this stage of development, as it says in the first bullet point, you would maintain the overhead carry. So, that means your starting position is both hands fully stretched so that you don't have the task of positioning those hands they're already in position and all you all the athlete has to do is go one two three prepare for force and on the count of four jump and grip the pull tightly um, what you can do in adding the run-up is you can raise the grip a little bit so if we kept the same grip um, as we had done for the one step drill on four all that happens is you get very little height and the athlete just flies horizontally uh, onto the sand. So that's your cue uh, that it's time to raise the grip. So for a four step run up, I would normally raise the grip by two fists, that amount there. Uh, but you can play around with raising the grip, uh, always making sure that you err on the side of it's better to have too low a grip than too high a grip. So if you have too high a grip, then the athlete won't have enough energy to get through onto the sand, uh, and they'll get stuck uh, up in the air, what we call stall out, uh, and so they could potentially fall backwards onto the runway. So that's obviously what you're trying to avoid. So uh, go up in one fist increments, um, and I would normally go one fist up for one step back. Okay, so um, so yeah, that's the this slide here is really what I've what I've been talking about there. That um, okay, the run up less is more. So at this stage, don't go beyond four steps. Um, um, yeah, good point at number three. Rest the pole tip on the floor again. It's just we've we've said the athlete will have the pole in the overhead position. Rest the pull tip on the floor. Again, it just means it's one less task for the athlete to worry about, and they're just focused on executing four steps, jump up, grip, and hold. And that very important, very important pit in the last, we want the hands up and straight. So if, if it's bent like this, then again, you've got the risk uh, of the athlete potentially falling backwards. Um, what I the analogy I use with a lot of athletes for this drill is that it's like it's like you're a, a gondolier in Venice. So if you see them, the arms always straight, and they're they're scooping their oar to move the gondolier forward uh, or the gondola forward, uh, and that's this, exactly the same motion here. You take off and then you scoop your gondola uh, to to bring you onto the sand. So um, that's the that's the basic uh, sand pit drill. So what I wanted to do now, we've got a couple of additional videos that show what you can start to do um, if you can get a hold of a couple of mats. So let's let, let, let's skip across to the the video clips. Um, as I say, the, the 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 sand pit is quite a basic drill to begin with. Um, but once you, your athlete is confident um, at doing that gondola action, then so in this clip here, uh, we're using four steps again to prepare this girl for a bending pull. Okay, so let's have a look again there. 
So it's one, two, three, four. She's all right. And you can see she's getting a little bit of bend in the pole. And we've positioned two mats so that if anything goes wrong uh, while she's learning to bend the pole, she's got a nice soft surface to land on. So let's take one more look at that again. Let's see if we could pause it at the takeoff in the sand. I don't know how, if that's possible. So if we can get the left foot take off, so that's good carriage. And now she's from her walking drill, she moves the pole in front of her. Boom, there we go. So you remember, you remember the, the drill we saw with Ellie? So she was doing it fully straight. Um, so this girl has takes up the same shape, but you can see she's now starting to put a little bit of bend. So what we're trying to do here, like I mentioned earlier, we want the brain to be comfortable with the idea of a pole that's starting to flex. So it's just a little bit of bend at this point. Um, and she's got the confidence that if she drives the pole forward, it'll flex a bit, but she knows she's gonna land on the mat. Then they see she actually starts pushing it out as she's in the air, getting used to the sensation of the bending pole. So then if we go to the second sandpit video, um, this is the next level up. So now um, the other girl that we saw doing the walking drills, she's gotten, uh, oops, oh, that's, that's the walking drill one. Uh, yes, that one. Um, so she's gotten really confident now. So she's, oh. <laughs> Okay, we'll play it again. We missed the bend bit. So she's getting, as I say, to be very confident now at bending the pole. So we thought we'd, well, we'd try a bit more in terms of swinging up and landing on her back to simulate what a full bend might look like. Okay, that's good. So there she goes. Now she will. Up, up. So this, the idea of landing on your back again is a very alien thing for the brain to accept uh, so you're asking uh, your brain to accept that you're going to bend a pole and you're going to flip yourself upside down uh, with no clear end objective so the brain being a good defense mechanism will say no nah, i'm not having any of that but this drill here i've found over the years um, helps a lot with just reassuring it that even when, when I go into that position alongside the pole, ah, oh, look, I end up having a nice soft landing. Now, the interesting thing is, and without getting myself into controversy, uh, what I've found over the years is that female vaulters will demand much more reassurance about these kinds of things than male vaulters. They, they want to know that the outcome is going to be okay. Uh, before they're prepared to give it a go. Uh, teenage boys in particular will just jump on anything you hand them. And then when they're lying in pieces on the floor, kind of go, well, what happened there? So I know which approach I favor. And so I'm more than happy to uh, come up with uh, more and more drills that help reassure people that, that flipping yourself onto your upside down uh, is gonna have a, a good outcome. So we, we've, we've taken the progression from a basic sandpit uh, model uh, through to a more advanced sandpit. So now finally, this was a young guy a few years ago um, doing that last drill that we saw on the sandpit. Uh, Matt, now he's doing it uh, into a proper pole vault takeoff box. So the only difference is in the sandpit, the sand will always move, but here, that box is not going to move. So you're going to get more force pushed back up through the pole and into the athlete's shoulders. Um, and, and so we, we have to prepare the athlete for that. And that's what that second sand pit drill was doing, was starting to put a little bit more force through whilst also getting them comfortable with landing on your back. So you can see this guy, if you look at this guy's head position, in the right hand top slide and in the bottom slide that's a classic uh, my brain's not sure about this i want to know where i am uh, head position um, as you do it more and more 
then that head position will tilt back more. And if the head position tilts back more, that in turn tilts your shoulders back more, and in turn allows your hips to move uh, further through. So I thought I keep this one because I think it's a good uh, example of, of the transition from sandpit uh, to proper vaulting. So speaking of transition, so we mentioned the girl Ellie uh, earlier. So I started working with her in 2014. So she went through the, the sandpit drills and the walking drills and the planting drills. And so here she is about a year later um doing a, an irish junior championship so it was a bit of a traumatic day for her um you'll see in the bottom right hand uh, picture that's not really the shape we want <laughs> so she, uh, for five of the six slides it's really really good so you can see in the top left hand slide she's running she's carrying the pole the right fist is on the right hip like we talked about and then in the next slide, as she starts to lower the pole, you'll see that right fist has gone back behind her hips a little bit. That's perfectly normal uh, at this point. The next, the right hand slide at the top, that's a really good position. Three steps out from takeoff. That's, I couldn't ask for any better. We, we've got the pole entirely horizontal uh, and the right hand is close to the hip. So it's ready to be pushed forward and up. So in the bottom slide, you can see in the left, in the left hand and the middle slide, she's done really well uh, to push that pole out in front of her. Uh, if you remember, that was walking drill number two. Um, but as we said before, unlike the sand, the box that you put the pole into, it's not going to move anywhere. So it's always going to win, and um, it's won here. So Ellie hasn't quite. Uh, Put enough. It's more to do what she's doing with her legs. She, she, instead of driving through it, she's taken off and stopped moving. Um, now she did land on the mat okay, um, but she learned very quickly that if you drop your right knee, you're going to get into trouble. So if we go to the next slide, you'll see a year later. Um, if we're we're focusing on her right knee that wasn't so good in 2015. So by October 2016, you can see that that right knee is being held up nicely in the, the top three slides. Uh, and that allows her then to get in behind her bending pole. Uh, and then as she releases it, so now she's able to get that fully extended position. So if you think about the guy that we showed who was just transitioning from uh, the sandpit drills to uh, the real vaulting, we talked about his head position, his brain wasn't comfortable about allowing the head to tilt back because he wasn't sure where he was in the air. So you can see in the bottom uh, middle slide and the bottom right hand slide, Ellie's head is now fully uh, pushed back and, and that allows her hips and legs to align uh, along the pole. So that that is two years work at that point so we've got another video clip now uh, from last year so it's 2019 as compared to 2016 um, on, on this video clip um, ellie was competing at the england athletics uh, under 23 championships um, which she was fortunate enough she, she won that competition um, this was her clearance at four meters. Um, so again, you'll see the same basics that we've talked about. Um, but now you can see, so she's running. That running action is very good. So she's able to move at speed over 14 steps. Um, she plants the pole. Oh, well, we'll get back to that in a second. Um, so she's, she's confident enough to throw that pole out in front and drive the bend uh, into the, the pole. And hopefully, hopefully we get a decent right knee after all the thing I've talked about. Yep, there we go, there we go. Yep, that's good, that's good. Tight into the pole, fully extend, let the pole push you up and over the bar. 
So that's that's an athlete six years into her, what we talked about at the start, her eight to 10 year journey. Um, still things to work at, um, but hopefully you can see how she's moved along from the moment she's picked up the pole to doing her sand pit drills, uh, to learning how to bend the pole, uh, to now being very confident of bending the pole um, and uh, jumping in excess of four meters. So some of you may then ask, okay, so what, what does that this athlete now need to do in her next uh, couple of years? And, and that's where you'll recall at the start, uh, I mentioned that we would, at, at the end of the presentation, we would uh, look at uh, some of the things needed to progress to the next level, <coughs> and in particular, that balance of physical and, and technical training. So th these are the kinds of questions that um, a lot that people have asked me down the years. And so hopefully we've, we've answered, I believe, the first bullet point. Um, and I believe through sand pit vaulting, and, and bringing in mats to supplement your sand pit vaulting. I think we've added a address point number two. Now, um, point number four, what does good technique look like? So those last uh, couple of photo sequences plus the final video uh, should, should answer that. I want to really focus now on that third bullet point. How much training is the right amount of training? So let's, let, let's flip to the next slide. So the factors that drive development in pole vault, so you've got under the heading of technical, we, we've seen how the run-up uh, is very important. The plant or that transition, maybe a better word for plant is your transition from carrying the pole horizontally to having it vertically in position and able to drive a bend into it. Then your swing which then leads to your extension position and your bar clearance. And one thing we haven't talked about up to now is pull selection. Now that really only becomes a, a, an issue once the athlete is bending the pull, but you, you, can, you have a, a vast range of pulls that you can potentially draw from. Um, and so in the case of uh, the, the female vaulters might start with uh, an 11 foot six or a 12 foot pole and progress through to 14 foot, 14 foot six, and, and in the case of Holly Bradshaw, 15 foot poles. On the physical side, um, so I mentioned about Ellie now is doing a lot of work on her run up speed, um, but speed on its own is no use unless you have the power to transfer that speed into a pole that's stiff enough that basically fights you uh, at takeoff, uh, and then you've got the gymnastic ability to rotate round whilst you're dealing with that bending pole, and that's what I mean about specific strength. <coughs> and plyometrics I, I put in as a heading um, in its own right because that's a very um, appropriate tool for the kind of gymnastic strength or specific strength you need uh, to, to deal with that bending pole uh, and to create the momentum in the first place to bend that pole. So on the left hand side, uh, I said so for technical development, you need access to good coaching. Uh, you need a sharing of best practice. You need access to good indoor facilities. You need access to a range of poles, and, and most importantly, at the end of it all, you need access to good competition. Now, that conversation in the context of everybody that's online tonight is maybe two, three years down the track. So you, if you're starting your vaulter uh, tomorrow, doing some sandpit drills at your local track, they'll, they'll be doing that potentially for a year. And then there's another year whilst they master the basics of bending the pole, which is like the, the still picks from 2015. And then in the third year, 
they're refining that activity and in that third year you would want to be having conversations with people in Welsh Athletics about the factors I've listed on the left hand side. On the right hand side um, what I found best down the years in my early years I went off to learn myself about speed and power and gymnastics and all of those things and I kind of ended up with information overload so more recently <clears throat> I find it's better to build good working relationships with experts uh, in, in, in each of these areas so that if you have someone you think has the potential to be very good you're uh, getting best practice in uh, how to lift weights, how to do plyometrics, how to do gymnastics. You're getting that best practice really from the earliest possible uh, opportunity. So th those are the factors that, that we need to consider. Um, in the next slide then, I I've tried to uh, visualize uh, what that might look like in, in terms of ratios that question, what is the right amount of training? Um, and so, as I said, in, in the first three years, I think you're looking at 75% technical training and 25% physical training. Um, and you're maybe looking at two to three, maximum of two to three sessions a week. And I try to suggest what those three sessions might be. In, in years four to six, then the, the balance starts to pivot uh, and I'm suggesting that 50-50 is, is the right uh, level um, and again try to set out based on an athlete training three to five times a week how would you distribute your time and then at year seven to ten if you're still working uh, with your athlete at that point and that athlete has shown the capability to become an advanced pole holder, uh, then I think you're you're really looking, and this is the phase that Ellie is now moving into, where the the, the, the greater balance of training is now physical. Uh, you're looking to make your gains through increases in speed and strength, and the athlete is training uh, upwards of six times a week. Um, and again, I've, I've tried to show how that might be might be broken down. This is just my personal view uh, on how it's done, but it, it it came out of a period of about ten years in Ireland when I think that we got the balance wrong. Basically, that we basically stuck with years one to three for the lifetime of the athlete, and ultimately limited uh, their potential to 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 jump the highest they could. So I'm just passing on the benefit of my mistakes uh, and, and how I think you can avoid them uh, in the future. So I think we're, we're at 10 to 8 now, so I think I've probably overrun maybe uh, by about five minutes or so. But at this point, I am open for a, a q and and I think if you, if you feed those through to Zoe, I think she's going to uh, ask them on your behalf, and I'll do my best to answer them. <clears throat> Hi Jim, thank you so much for giving us some great insights and I guess a culmination of a good few years of coaching. Um, so we've had some lovely comments saying how interesting it's been um, and I think that people are, are excited to just listen to your journey and realise that um, everybody starts somewhere. Yes, absolutely. There's no, there's no great rocket science to coaching. Uh, I, I think, um, as you say, everybody's got to start somewhere. Um, like I said at the beginning, fear of making mistakes often holds people back from actually putting that first foot forward. And as I said, I, I want to emphasize that making mistakes is both expected and good. So don't don't hold yourself back because you think you don't know or I'm gonna make a fool of myself. Um, <clears throat> athletes are very smart. They 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 know when people are genuine and when they are 
trying to do their best um, trying to find information that they don't have um, and they can see when you're working on their behalf um, they will forgive you if they can see that you're genuinely trying to solve their issues <coughs> on the opposite okay. side they're very okay. smart that uh, if you try to bluff them they'll see right through you um so our first question um is it's um around what should you kind of do with an athlete initially so the question reads when starting an athlete off what are the two most important things to remember Okay, so the single most important thing that you can give a pole vaulter on day one uh, is the advice that your dominant arm must be fully straight at the point of takeoff. Uh, everything comes from that. Um, I have had athletes, particularly multi-event athletes down the years, where I've, I've spent years trying to undo uh, a bent top arm so if, if you can pass on the advice uh, that that top hand being straight at the point of takeoff um, that's the single most important thing uh, that you can do and then the other uh, thing that i would say and I, I keep repeating it is uh, don't be afraid to try things and so whilst we say that to the coach it also applies to the athlete um, the, <coughs> The one thing I haven't really touched on is, has been the relationship between coach and athlete. It, that is pivotal, especially in pole vault, because from time to time, you are going to ask your athlete to do things that they do not want to do, um, that they cannot see why you're doing it, that they feel is going to put them at risk. Um, that getting through that really boils down to the relationship when you come through that challenge and the athlete is able to execute the thing that they thought they couldn't do it is fantastically empowering for the coach athlete relationship um, so to, to, to answer the question quickly uh, get a straight top arm uh, and trust your coach will be the two most important things uh, for me, uh, for a beginner pole vaulter. Next question, Jim, is how do you stop an athlete running through? Okay, so athletes run through when they're not sure. That, that's it in a nutshell. Um, so in the presentation, I, I've tried to build up in incrementally from picking up the pole to doing the one step in the sand, to doing the four step in the sand. But you're right, at some point on your journey, your athlete is going to run through because they're <clears throat> unsure about some aspect or um, they've, they've maybe, <clears throat> they're unsure about what it is you're asking them to do. They're unsure about the pole you're asking them to do it on what i generally find is if it becomes an issue in every session then you need to go back a step so if you've got to i don't know let's say you were doing you were doing four step sand pit jumping without any difficulty and you went to six and the athlete starts running through and then you go back to four and you build it up again and you maybe do six step running drills just alongside the mat so uh, running through comes back to that basic principle that the brain is there to keep you safe so unless your brain is fully bought in to what is being asked then the run through is almost inevitable <clears throat> conversely if you've come at it slowly enough and you've built it up to a point where it's almost impossible for the brain to say, I won't do this, then you won't get run-throughs. And the more you don't get run-throughs, the more self-confident the athlete becomes, becomes a virtuous circle. 
that, that they become less and less likely to run through because it's been so long since they've last done it. So I know I'm being wordy again. So the straight answer is um, it, you can't avoid it. You will, uh, particularly with beginner athletes, you will have run-throughs. Um, one or two is not an issue. Um, but if you're getting six or eight, then you need to go back one step and build back uh, to a point of, of, of revisiting the, the aspect that, that's causing the athlete to run through. Next question is, how do you know when an athlete needs to change up a pole? Okay, um, so pole vaulting is essentially a, a vertical activity. Um, if the athlete is um, traveling forward more than they're going up, that is the clue that, that, that you need to change up to a stiffer pole. Um, the easiest indicator is if you've got your uprights on 80 and the athlete is still plowing through the bar, then the pole is too soft. Great. So we've, talked a, we've, talked a lot of, we've talked a lot about sort of fear and being frightened. And um, I think a lot of people are quite interested in, in this question. So have you ever had an athlete snap a pole? Um, as I said, I, I was a pretty poor vaulter. I snapped three poles. Um, I can remember one, we were sharing an indoor sports centre with some badminton players. And I snapped a pole in the top left-hand corner of the sports hall and the bottom half of my pole landed in the badminton court in the bottom right-hand corner of the pole. So um, it is it is something that you should expect every athlete to encounter at some point. Um, normally the best way, <clears throat> if it happens, it's generally happened because the pole has got damaged, uh, usually in transit or it's picked up a chip when it's landed on the ground. The best thing you can do is get another pole into the athlete's hand as quickly as possible and get them off the ground again. The longer you delay, between taking off again, the brain or defensive mechanism has a chance to think about what just happened and go, mm, no, I'm not going to let that happen again. Whereas if you immediately get a pull into the athlete's hand and get them off the ground again, we find that the brain gives you a Bible. It says, I don't know what happened there, but I then did it again and it didn't happen, so therefore it must just have been a one off. Last question, Jim. So how many times a week should you do full approach pole vault running, um, pole vault? So um, I, was, I was about to say it depends on the level of the athlete, but actually, no, I don't think it does. Uh, I, I think no more than once a week should you do full approach, no matter the level. <clears throat> if you are in that uh, more advanced category, that is potentially jumping twice a week. You, you, you wouldn't want to jump more than twice a week because you've got lots of other things that you need to be doing. and You need recovery time. So to, to, to jump full approach, you want to be at your freshest. Um, now, even in the middle of winter, freshness is a kind of relative term, but if you've been lifting, if you've been doing gymnastics, if you've been doing plyometrics, you are not ideally placed to do a full approach fault session. <clears throat> so I normally, for the more advanced athletes that I'm working with, um, I would schedule our full approach on the weekend and a short approach midweek and, and then tailor my other training around it. So I will generally expect the midweek short approach session to be a bit of a struggle because typically the, the vaulter may have either lifted the day before or the day before the day before so they're going to be bringing muscle fatigue into that session <coughs> oh sorry I'm not used to speaking for an hour <laughs> um, so the, the 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 enemy of a full approach session is muscle fatigue 
you will have you will end up factorial point by run throughs. You'll increase the likelihood of run throughs because the athlete knows fine well they're tired, and they also know fine well the implications of taking off on a big pole when they're tired. So bring your athlete to a full approach session fresh and bring them no more than once a week <clears throat> would be my advice and then tailor your other training let's say for example you might have the day before full approach as a recovery day so then you have five other days of training uh, to potentially fill uh, and still get a good quality full approach session so hopefully just, that will happen just to kind of like elaborate on that what does what does full approach how many strides would that be for um an entry level athlete versus a performance athlete so for an entry level athlete um i'm not even sure that i would use the term full approach so if can we can we flip back to the uh the percentages chart this will this will help me answer the question a little better so our entry our entry level athlete i'll call it years one to three <clears throat> so you can see no more than one pole vault session per week so that they, at that point they probably will only have one run up um so that almost by definition is their full approach run up so the entry level athlete will have a run up typically either eight steps or ten steps maybe even as far as 12 steps but certainly 10 steps and like i said earlier you you want that athlete to also come to pole vaulting fresh because no um, because we want the athletes to build confidence they, they want to in years one to three they want to enjoy the work and you want to reinforce to the brain that <coughs> pole vaulting is fun pole vaulting is productive that it's a positive experience that makes me want to do it more so therefore when i get to years four to six and we and we up the ratio to two sessions a week um, the the athlete is wanting to do two sessions a week so you'll see well, by the time we get to the advanced athlete training four to six times a week it's still only two pole vault sessions a week because they they a full approach session for the advanced athlete, which could be <clears throat> up to 14 steps for women and up to 16, maybe even 18 for men, it will take it out of you. It will physically and mentally tire you. <clears throat> so you need time to recover. You need time to get your other sessions done and also have that uh, pre-session recovery so that you come to it fresh um, so as i say entry level athlete one run up eight to ten steps only you want the athlete to come to the session fresh uh, the advanced athlete anywhere between 14 and 18 steps <clears throat> still only one full approach session a week and the second shorter what we call short approach session which should either be eight or ten steps, small poles, maybe working on one or two specific technical shapes, um, and accepting that that second session is going to be suboptimal because you're going to be bringing fatigue from your other sessions into it. But that's okay. You you, you limit the number of jumps to take account of the fatigue level of the athlete. So I hope, yeah. I hope that's clear for everybody no it's been fantastic jim thank you so much for being part of our stay in balls webinar series and um, yes i've thoroughly really enjoyed it i hope i hope at some point i'll be able to come over and actually do a practical session rather than trying to do all this theoretical stuff over the computer i'm sure that, that will be um really well received and if anybody's interested in that happening then if you just email me uh, zoe.brown at welshathletics.org, I'm sure myself and Jim could try and organise things whenever the restriction allows us to. So thank you so much again um, for I giving up your I evening. I, I, I can't let you away, Zoe, without, of course, confessing to the fact that 
Uh, I was your coach for over 10 years. And uh, so I did travel the full journey and uh, thoroughly enjoyed every moment of it. I'm happy to share our experiences with the, the next generation. Definitely. We, we, I think we, we made all the mistakes, Jim, but we had some good outcomes at the end. And, and that's kind of the, the learning journey. So, and that's why you did what you did. And that's why I'm where I am now and working in this uh, coach development capacity um, to help and support other coaches to be as good as you are. <laughs> well, listen, thank you very much, everyone. I really enjoyed it and look forward to talking to you next time. Thanks very much, everybody. Night-night. Bye.